Between April of 1971 and September of 1972, six young African-American girls were abducted and murdered in the Washington, D.C. area by a killer known only as the Freeway Phantom. The women were all of the ages between 10 and 18 years old, and all the murders remain unsolved. Carol Spinks was a shy 13-year-old. A 7th grader at Johnson Junior High School in Washington, D.C., she had an identical twin sister named Carolyn. On April 25, 1971, Carol's older sister, Valerie, asked Carol if she would go nearby to a 7-Eleven to pick up some groceries for her. In return, she could pick up a soda for herself. Carol accepted the offer and took five dollars from her sister. She began walking down the street towards the 7-Eleven. It was just about half a mile away from her home. On her way there, Carol bumped into her mother, who reprimanded her for being out on her own and told her to get back home straight after she purchased the groceries. Carol said that she would. She arrived at the convenience store, picked up the groceries and a soda for herself, then left after paying for the items. Shortly after leaving the store, another kid from the neighborhood saw her walking back home with a bag of groceries in her hands. However, at some point during that short trip back to her house, she disappeared. When she failed to return home that night, her family reported her missing. A group of volunteers and family members searched the neighborhood for the missing teenager, but were unable to find anything. Six days later, Carol's fully clothed body was discovered by an 11-year-old boy dumped on the side of the Anacostia Freeway. An autopsy determined that she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Before her death, it appeared that the victim had been brutally hit in the face more than once. There were also cuts on various parts of her body, in particular, her face, torso, and arms. She had been dead for two to three days. Police believed that the kidnapper had fed her in the few days before killing her, as her stomach contained some kind of citrus fruit. The only piece of evidence that was found were small green fibers that were found on her clothing. It was believed that these had come from a vehicle or a carpet or rug of some kind, but it failed to generate any leads. Darlena Denise Johnson was a 16-year-old girl that lived in Congress Heights, which was only a few blocks from Carol's house. Darlena had recently taken a summer job working as a counselor at Oxen Hill Recreation Center. Every morning, she would walk to the job on the same street where Carol was kidnapped. On July 8, 1971, at 10.30 a.m., Darlena said goodbye to her mother and headed off for work. She told her mother that she was going to be staying the night at the rec center as they were hosting a sleepover event for kids that would stretch into the following morning. She would never arrive at her place of employment. The next day, when she didn't arrive home and no one had seen her at the job, she was reported missing. A few witnesses came forward and claimed to have seen her on the day of the disappearance. One witness claimed to have seen her and her boyfriend that afternoon, but the boyfriend's mother did not allow the police to question her son. Another witness claimed to have seen Darlena driving around in a black car with an older African-American male around the time that she was abducted. However, the witness could not provide any specific details about the car she was traveling in. A few days later, 
a DC Department of Highways and Traffic employee, was having some car trouble and pulled off the road. When he got out of his car, he discovered a body lying in the grass. He immediately notified the police. The body was recovered and was identified as Darlena Johnson. Her face and body were so badly decomposed that the medical examiner had to cut off her fingers to identify her. Her body was just 15 feet from where Spink's remains had been discovered just two and a half months prior. An autopsy was performed, but it could not determine the cause of her death as her body was so badly decomposed. Even though Carol and Darlena's murders were similar, down to even the disposal area, the police did not acknowledge that they had a serial killer on their hands. Brenda Crockett was a 10-year-old living with her family in Northwest DC. On the evening of July 27, 1971, at around 8 p.m., Brenda was sent by her mother to a nearby store, Safeway, which was only five blocks from her home, to pick up some bread and some food for the family's three dogs. Her mother would later state that she told Brenda to take a friend with her, but it seemed Brenda left alone. When she didn't return after an hour, her mother went looking for her while Brenda's only sister, Bertha, stayed at the house with her mother's boyfriend. As Bertha was waiting, she was startled by a phone ringing. Bertha picked up the phone and found Brenda on the other end. She told her sister that a white man snatched her up and took her somewhere in Virginia, but was sending her home in a taxi before the call came to an abrupt end. Brenda was crying. Considering that Virginia was approximately 200 miles away from where Brenda was last seen and that she had been missing for only three hours, it seemed highly unlikely that she was actually in Virginia. 25 minutes later, at around 10 p.m., Brenda called again and this time talked to her mother's boyfriend, who asked if she knew where she was in Virginia. She said, no, did my mother see me? He said, how can your mother see you if you're in Virginia? Then he heard footsteps in the background before Brenda said, I'll see you, before the line went dead. That was the last time anyone heard from Brenda. Approximately eight hours after Brenda's disappearance, a hitchhiker that was traveling on US Route 50 discovered the body of Brenda. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a scarf. Her bare feet were pristine, like someone had washed them. Authorities also found small green fibers, just like the ones found at Carol's crime scene. Nino Moshia Yates was a 12-year-old who lived with her father and stepmother in an apartment in Northeast Washington, D.C., along Benning Road. Her stepmother had just had a baby, and Yates' dad needed to be with his wife and the newborn at the hospital. On October 1, 1971, Nino Moshia Yates was sent by her family to Safeway Grocery Store, which was just down the street from their apartment. She had been sent to buy sugar, flour, and paper plates. Later, a store clerk said that she had purchased the items from him at around 7 p.m. This would be the last time she was seen alive. Afterwards, an employee would find the same items outside of the store, scattered along the street. Three hours later, a 16-year-old boy found Nino Moshia's body along Pennsylvania Avenue, just east of Washington, D.C. She, too, had been sexually assaulted and strangled. Coroners would later note that the strangulation was excessive, with the girl's esophagus having been broken. Green fibers were also found at the crime scene, indicating a link to the previous murders. The only clue that came to the police was from a neighbor who saw Nino Moshia Yates getting into a blue Volkswagen. This neighbor had thought nothing of it at the time, since one of her family's friends drove a similar car. However, the police were unable to find the person driving the blue Volkswagen, and the killings continued. Brenda Denise Woodward was an 18-year-old that lived with her family in Baltimore, Maryland, along Maryland Avenue. In the fall of 1971, she began taking night classes at Cardozo High School, 
hoping to improve her typing and shorthand skills. On the evening of November 15, 1971, she and a classmate stopped at Ben's Chili Bowl for dinner. The classmate usually drove her home, but his car was in the shop, so the pair took the bus. Woodward got off a few blocks later and transferred to another bus while her classmate continued on. This was the last time she was seen alive. The following morning, police officer David Norman spotted Brenda's body on Hospital Drive, just south of Route 202, near Prince George's Hospital. Brenda's velvet coat was draped over her, her black turtleneck was inside out, and buttons were missing from her coat and skirt. She had been sexually assaulted, strangled, and stabbed four times. Investigators would find defensive marks on her hands and arms, indicating that she fought her killer. Investigators also discovered a puzzling note written in pencil, which was stuffed in Brenda's coat pocket. The note read, This is tantamount to insensitivity to people, especially women. I will admit the others when you catch me if you can. Freeway Phantom. Authorities theorized that Brenda wrote the note as dictated by the killer because the FBI matched it to other writings by her. Police also found two different hair samples on Brenda's clothing. One belonged to a Caucasian man, and the other belonged to an African-American man. Despite having the hair samples, police were unable to determine the identity or even confirm if any of them had come from the actual killer. Following the murder of Brenda Woodard, the freeway phantom disappeared for a while, leading police to believe that he had left the area or gotten locked up for another crime. However, 10 months later, he would strike again. Diane Denise Williams was a 17-year-old who had just started her senior year at Bayou High School in Washington, D.C. On September 5, 1972, Diane cooked dinner for her family and then set off to visit her boyfriend for the evening. Diane would spend the evening with her boyfriend and would later walk him to the bus stop for her trip home to Holly Terrace in the southeast. Diane was last seen by her boyfriend boarding a city bus. She never made it home that night. On September 6, 1972, the body of Diane was found by a trucker who had pulled off the road along Interstate 295. He notified the police, and it was immediately theorized that Diane was a victim of the freeway phantom. An autopsy was conducted, and it was found that she was strangled, but there was no sign of sexual assault. Strangely, her shoes were removed and placed next to her, and Diane was written on the bottom of one of her white sneakers. Despite there being no sign of sexual assault, police recovered semen from her clothes, but initially dismissed it after assuming Diane had intercourse with her boyfriend the previous night, even though her boyfriend insisted that they didn't have any kind of sexual activity that night. It was after the discovery of the fourth victim, Nino Moshia Yates, that the cases were officially linked and the media began referring to the killer as the Freeway Phantom. And it was also after the fourth murder that the FBI got involved. Before that, the Metropolitan Police Department of the District of Columbia did most of the investigating. In 1974, an FBI task force was set up to investigate the case. The task force was large and therefore able to interview and interrogate a number of suspects and follow up on tips and leads that they were sent. However, their search came to no solid conclusions. All of these victims had a number of traits in common. They were all African-American females between the ages of 10 and 18 that lived along the Washington Beltway. All had been abducted while walking, and all bodies had been dumped off busy roads, such as interstates and freeways. They were all of a similar build, small and petite, which led investigators to believe that the killer may have mistaken them for being in the same age range. One of the strongest suspects was Robert Askins. 
He was a computer technician who had served time for poisoning a prostitute with potassium cyanide in 1938. In 1938, Robert would be sent to St. Elizabeth's Hospital until he was mentally fit enough to stand trial. In 1952, he was finally convicted of the murder. He spent the next few years in prison until he was freed in 1958 after his sentence was overturned on a legal technicality. Later, police would interview Askins about his involvement in an unrelated crime where he abducted a 24-year-old woman at gunpoint and then sexually assaulted her. It was at this point police learned about his previous prison time and started to connect him to the Freeway Phantom murders. Not only did Askins seem to commit a similar crime in the vicinity of the Freeway Phantom murders, but he lived and worked in the region. Askins also seemed to match the Freeway Phantom's criteria set by the police. He was a middle-aged black man that lived in the neighborhood. He had a proclivity for targeting similar victims and he harbored a violent grudge against women. In March of 1977, authorities got a search warrant for Askins' house. When they searched Askins' row house, they found the appellate court's opinion from his previous conviction. This written opinion used the word tantamount, the same word used in the note found in Woodard's pocket, and an odd word for someone to use. It was found that Askins was known to use the word when attempting to stress the importance of matters related to his work. They also found soiled women's scarves, photos of girls and young women, a knife used in another crime, and an essay from a young girl. Another warrant was issued a month later, allowing police to search Askins' vehicle. They found two buttons and a gold earring under his back seat. However, police didn't have any evidence to tie him to the Freeway Phantom killings. The green fibers found on five of the six victims didn't match the fibers found in his home or car, and hairs found on them came back negative. Askins was later convicted of kidnapping and raping two other women in the district several years after the Freeway killings and received a life sentence. He died in prison on April 30th, 2010, at age 91. One of the other leads were the Green Vega Rapists, a gang who were known for abducting and raping girls and women in the Washington, D.C., Maryland area. These men drove around in a green Chevy Vega, which they used to kidnap and sexually assault young women. The girls were all similar ages to those who were victim to the Freeway Phantom killings. The Green Vega gang members were individually interviewed by homicide detectives at Lorton Prison in Virginia, where the gang members were serving sentences for their unrelated crimes. During these interviews, one gang member initially implicated another gang member, who he said told him he was involved and gave information about one of the Freeway Phantom murders. This particular inmate was also serving a sentence at Lorton Prison for the Green Vega convictions. The inmate, being interviewed, said that he would provide the information only if they kept his name out of it, which was agreed upon. The inmate then gave investigators information about the Freeway Phantom crimes, which he alleged were perpetrated by a member of the Green Vegas. He gave details of the specific dates, times, and locations which was not provided to the public, but which was known only to the perpetrator and to detectives. The inmate who provided the information said he was not involved in the homicide and provided an alibi which was found to be verifiable. During this period, an election was being held in Maryland, and one of the candidates publicly announced to the press that a break had occurred in the Freeway Phantom investigation and provided that an inmate at Lorton Prison had given the information. After that announcement, the inmate who provided the information declined any further interviews and immediately recanted all his prior statements. With no other leads or suspects, the case soon went cold. It wasn't until 2001 that the case was officially reopened. However, it was found that over the years, the original case files from DC police had been lost as well as the physical evidence in the case. 
Investigators currently have only FBI records and records from Maryland police departments to work from, but even those are incomplete. Luckily, the semen sample taken from Diane's crime scene was preserved and was sent to the MD State Police, where a catastrophic mishandling of evidence occurred. The state police sent the samples to the FBI, who then returned it to the MD State Police again years later after not testing it. Since then, the DNA has not been officially tested or even located, and since most of the information and evidence on the cases has disappeared, there is little hope that the Freeway Phantom killings will ever be solved.